वन एंड आई थिंक वी आर नाउ लाइव ऑन फेसबुक गुड इवनिंग एंड वेलकम टू द टेंथ कारवान डिस्टिंग्विश लेक्चर which will be delivered by a very special guest one of my favorites dr reema huja ma'am today we she is going to speak about rajasthan through the ages and overview though she doesn't need an introduction but as it is in the uh, schedule i have to give a small introduction of our speaker dr reema huja is an archaeologist historian and former member of the national Mon monuments authority dr huja is currently the director of maharaja sevai man singh second Museum City Palace Jaipur and managing trustee of Jaipur Virasat Foundation who also runs animal care trust housing over 60 cats her books include prince patriot parliamentarian crusader for self rule rajasthani stories retold rajasthan a concise history and maharana pratap an archaeologist historian consultant heritage consultant and writer dr guja has a phd from cambridge university and today we are more than honored to have her after a long time we have been trying to uh, reach out to her but she was also um, been in the influence of covid virus and now i think she is re recovering well so thank you so much ma'am for agreeing to do this lecture and we are more than honored to have you and over to you and we'll we'll have a conversation after the lecture where we'll be taking audience questions so those of you who have question can write it on the live facebook chat or zoom chat we'll take that in the uh, q and a session over to you ma'am thank you very much thank you ishan uh, with that introduction i was looking around to see if you really meant me because it's pretty embarrassing to have that now just in case we get some unexpected interruptions uh, it's just to show you how important i am we i'm still at work so somebody might just come in and you'll see my hand going off So that's my apology in advance. This, the truth is actually they are all actors. They've been told to come in, you know, just to make me seem important. Uh, thank you very much to Karva for having me here, and I've been following some of your other talks with great interest. And I intend to really get back and follow it all through. We've all been hearing so much online that uh, I thought I would do a pictorial, uh, a more pictorial thing today. basically because i wasn't sure if i would hold your interest long enough with my wobbling on about various things so when i say rajasthan through the ages and overview that is really what i am hoping to give you through the ages overview some of you who might have come in wanting uh, much more on a particular point of part of history aspect decade century you may not get that but uh, if i if at the end of this you still feel you want to know more about rajasthan will always be i am always be going to be around so i want to this is always a very tricky experience putting my uh, um powerpoint on but i think it should work yes there we are fingers crossed so rather dramatically i would like to open the gates take you back in time through time to Rajasthan but i am doing it so that is modern day rajasthan and at the bottom of the screen to my well somebody's right or left it says it gives the area in square kilometers so rajasthan is roughly the size and shape of france and i've said this so many times that uh, some of my friends kind of close their ears when i say this but the reason i say this is it is a large area and therefore when we say that the present state of rajasthan came into being in 1949 there were 19 separate states and two chiefdoms that became you know part of rajasthan that's just to give you the scale of it uh, they had of course signed individual instruments of accession to new india in 47 and it was much later uh, between 48 and 1950 when all the other princely states joined india or they sorry let me rephrase that all of them had acceded to the independent nation state in 47 but they continued to be entities in their own right so when they become merged into the new states that process for rajasthan happens and 49 is the official date that we have but then as you see one of the paragraphs on my screen 
that uh, some more British administered Aj Ajmer Merwada part of Abu, some other enclaves were merged. And that is as late as 1956. So of course, there has been minor border uh, reconciliation of these. But I will come back to this point at the end, what it means, what it means in terms of an identity when for somebody who was 40 or 50 in 1948, you suddenly become from being a resident of Jhalawad state. You are part of, you were always part of India in a, in a much looser sense, but you are now part of Rajasthan. I'll come back to that right at the end. But let's go back on our journey through time. And uh, this is not a jump lesson, but just to tell you where we are located, uh, the Aravli range, yes, the cursor does work, basically bisects Rajasthan. And there'll be another map up in a second, which where you'll see this area, sort of southeast, has more rainfall, has more rivers, therefore has different crops, also has, uh, you know, it's, it's part of the uh, Indo-Gangetic Plain in a different way to the area to the west where you have the true desert, where a lot of trade came in, a lot of activity happened, but it, it also means different food crops are possible, uh, subsistence uh, farming, camels, We'll come back to camels, I have it marked somewhere. So this is the Rajasthan we are talking about. And just to, since people are still joining, just to drive home the point that modern day Rajasthan is the largest state of the country of India. Uh, the former state of Jaipur, Dundar state, and I'm saying this because I'm sitting in Jaipur and I happen to be talking from the heart of old Jaipur, the World Heritage City, the city palace area. So. Um, was approximately the size of Switzerland. Now, just to give you a proportion of a, a, a sense of the size and the proportion. So again, you have lots of little squiggles. Most of the rivers here join the Raja Chambal and then the Jamna and they're part, as I said, of the Indo-Gangetic Plain. Uh, that's our Haryana, UP, uh, Punjab up there. That is the boundary with present day Pakistan. Uh, except that it wasn't a Pakistan. So Jaisalmer, Bikaner would have had more interaction that way. Certainly stories and history tell us that. These rivers are often perennial now. Sorry, their rivers are mostly there in name now. If you're lucky, you'll find some water. Most of the time, if there's a storm, there might be water. But they would have gone out through Gujarat to the Gulf of Kambhat. Uh, but when I say that, again, keep in mind that Several uh, thousand years ago, the climate would have been different. The topography would have been more or less the same, but different. And the desert would not have been a true desert. So the point I need to kind of stress here that Rajasthan has had more than 20 to 25 kingdoms over different centuries. And these are distinct from little uh, semi-feudal states. These are kingdoms, you know, with a, with a a, for, a, a small state. And therefore, there are cities, hill forts, towns, villages, and very small settlements across in the plains, in the deserts, hills, valleys. Uh, because there are relatively fewer lakes and rivers and a difficult terrain, the Thar Desert becomes central in almost everybody's mind as what constitutes Rajasthan. So I do need to say there that uh, the desert here are uh, we, we keep saying Thar now, but it used to be Thar Parkar. So the old Thar Parkar, which goes into Cholistan in Pakistan, is uh, supposedly the most inhabited desert in the world. So even though we have scant habitation today, but uh, as compared to uh, Rubal Khali in, in the Sahara or something like that, uh, we've had more habitation through time. Now, water obviously is important. So human-made wells, um, reservoirs, step wells, ritual related water bodies. And because everything, craft, industry, agriculture, pastoralism need water, so do uh, religious places. Water has shaped the culture, cultural landscapes and the built and intangible heritage. Uh, while you look at some of these images as a child, I remember hearing someone in I have no idea where it was, whether it was Marwar, you know, over time. 
but it was definitely a desert area where the saying was that you can spill as much ghee, clarified butter as you want, but a drop of water is more precious than blood because a drop of water was blood. What you have here, the black and white is a 1950s image of Pushkar. Um, the top is uh, Garsi Sar, a human made lake, artificial uh, a water reservoir really, which was supplying drinking water. Now we do have boats on it, but that is not how they would have treated the water in the past. To the cursor needs to move because I can't tell my right from left at this point. Uh, this is Zawar mining area, and this is Zawar. Uh, that there's a temple, 16th century temple. So water was always there with shrines, with also spaces for people to drink. And uh, the the last of the photographs left is a very tiny hot sulfur spring in the middle of Shekhawati. Uh, again, the legend there is that it is one, of course, according to them, the only one, but it is a place where the Pandavas of the Mahabharat came and their penance would be over whenever their weapons started to melt, basically sulfuric uh, action. So this, this kind of thing you find all over India, there's always one holy lake in different parts of India. This is one of the many in Rajasthan where the story allegedly, like this is the true place. So uh, driving home the point of water, these were created by the rulers, by merchants and traders, and almost everyone and were, were uh, maintained by them. And therefore, very quickly, Ajmer has the famous Anna Sagar. Uh, there was a Visa Lake that came up, which has now been covered over. Garsi Sar, I showed you an image of. Uh, Kishore Sagar at Kota, Udaipur's very famous Pichola, which uh, urban legend, well, urban legend from back then said it had been made by a prosper, prosperous Banjara trader. Uh, he was always lucky Banjara because, you know, somebody who was earning millions, luck. And Raj Saman, built by Maharana Raj Singh in the 17th century. These are some examples. Uh, so I think the importance of water being stressed, sepwells, all of that comes in sacred groves. Let's carry on. Now, what I will find is that I'm not having, I don't wish to, but there also is not time to go into the pre and proto history or early history. And therefore I'm going to skim over a lot of it. I'm going to skim over details, but very quickly, our uh, local history of the area goes back in time. I think I want to put in a, a kind of a footnote, if you can call a footnote in the middle of a lecture, a footnote, footnote more likely. And that is that um, the overall story that I'm telling you today, think of it as a case study of pan Indian history. So it's not that I'm showing you something that is unique to Rajasthan, though it is unique to Rajasthan, in a similar circumstance, in a similar situation, something like this could have happened. So in our case, uh, yes, the old Stone Age is there. But then what we have with the Chalcolithic, where you have the use of copper tools along with stone tools, is one, there are sites in Rajasthan which are linked to the Harappan sites, and that is the northern part of Rajasthan, and I'm not going back on the map, but the Ganganagar area. The, the area around Udaipur is where you have another site which is using copper and uh, stone at the same time. So roughly we are talking, you know, 5,000 years before today, 2,500 BCE. And then there's another uh, group which is much more interesting, but we know far little less about it. And that is uh, around the area from where the modern day Khetri copper mines, you know, Hindustan Copper Limited or something it used to be was, and that is around the Shekhawati area or the central, northern central area. So three of these cult copper sites are existing at the same time. I'm going to gloss over some of it. And the reason I will talk a little bit about them is that the average Indian, I'm including myself in it, we've been brought up, average anyone across the world, you think in times of, yes, you have the stone age, then you have a, you know, you get technologically more complex. So that's the development of the human mind. But the human mind, and I'm quoting 
some bi biology professor who lectured on paleoanthropology, that the human mind 50,000 years ago was capable of thinking like you and I today. So in theory, if they had the technology for it, they could have had a computer. They did not because it's, and, and again, for me, the uh, thing is, I know how to switch a light on, but I don't really know how to make a light bulb or how to put in an electricity line. So I don't have the background to it. But in theory, our minds, barring a few crinkles here and there, our brains, not our minds, our brains 50,000 years ago and today are more or less the same. So next time you go into a museum and you walk past the stone tools or you walk past a bead, just stop half a second and think real people like, you know, could have thought like us who would have felt uh, a wound or, or a moment of happiness like us would have worn something like that bead or would have played with that uh, toy cart that you see in the shelf as you uh, in the display as you walk past it. So coming back to our sites, the Harappan sites, over 25 of them have been explored in the northern part, are more or less contemporary, but quite different to, and this is early excavations, and way back, uh, if the cursor will let me, is the Ghaggar River, which flows into the Indus in Pakistan. But we also had around Udaipur area and Chittorgarh area, sites that used local copper to make a few copper tools that had a pottery very different to the Harappan pottery, where, so this is one of the sites, Gilund. Uh, this has been excavated in part over time and over 90 sites have been found. So they had copper smelting, they had rice, they had wheat, they made copper items, they used a black and red pottery. They stored wheat, they had seals at Gilon, but nowhere else yet. And we think they had long distance trade because at Ahar, they found a couple of, uh, the Ahar sites, not just at Ahar, Ahar, Balathal, Gilun, they have found some lapis lazuli beads. Lapis lazuli comes to Rajasthan, it comes to Jaipur, it's been used in beadwork in modern day uh, gem polishing industry in Rajasthan, but it still comes from the Afghanistan area. In fact, even in the days when Afghanistan was seeing a lot of internal strife uh, in the 80s, lapis lazuli was still coming in. But the point here is that something like that doesn't necessarily mean one caravan coming all the way from Afghanistan to the Chittor area or the Udaipur area carrying lapis lazuli beads. It's probably somebody exchanges it in the Punjab area, it moves somewhere else. We know too little about this 2500 BCE period, 5000 years before today, but it's still something interesting to know. Now they don't seem to have any evidence here at present of anything to do with Harappa. But the third group I mentioned, Ganeshwar, where it's an intriguing thing. I'm showing you a lot of black and white images here. So they are arrowheads, uh, they are copper uh, uh, axe heads or celts, they are fish hooks. G uh, Ganeshwar is, uh, you think of the average campus and then you think of you know where your own university uh, building might be, college might be. In a very small settlement area, they found evidence of round huts and they found over 5,000 copper tools. So 5,000 copper tools, hunting gathering, they're eating the animals, no other uh, evidence of uh, what they call in history or, or sociology, complex society. So you don't have your houses going up two or three floors like at Harappa. You don't have copper smelting done locally like at the Ahar sites, like at Gulund, or like at Balathal where they found early iron. You just find 5,000 types, different copper tools and people who live by hunting gathering. What were they doing? We know that this copper is 97% pure. It was supplied, uh, it ends up at Kalibanga, but you also find it at Mohanjodaro. So was it being traded? If it was being traded, who was trading? And then what I said earlier, you talk about society developing. Are they less developed, though they are making the copper, but they live in huts? Is it a question of choice? I'm going to leave that there, leave prehistory there and move forward. So I do love to leave unanswered questions, which we can come back to. Uh, 
jumping in time to from sort of 2500 BC to about 2500, 25 BC or 300 BC or wherever you want to put it to give a proper uh, thing, um, time space to those of you who might not be thinking ADBC or CEBCE, -E, roughly the time of Alexander. So when that young Alexander is uh, kind of on the area where uh, it says Yavan on my map, there we are. India seems to have had several units that we know of, which are either kingdoms or republics. So period of our Solasa Mahajanpat. Um, there's a little story to some of the words we have here. So the Yavan part is where the Greeks stay on after Alexander leaves, except the term we have in Sanskrit for them, which becomes a term for the outsider for a while, then it gets overtaken by another word, comes from the Ionian Greeks, because apparently, now this is hearsay, but it's hearsay read somewhere and forgotten. The Ionian Greeks were the first Greeks that people of this area had come into contact with. So everybody gets that Pan Yavan name. And in much later Sanskrit theater, the backdrop is known as the Yavan Pattika, the cloth or the back scene that the Greeks bring in because Aaron had a storyteller, but no backdrop. Anyway, I don't think you want to hear only about young Alexander, uh, though he died young, so he remains young, but also to connect up here with one of the political states of that rough approximate period of the age of the Buddha and Mahavir Swami. And that is the Matsya area. This is roughly the Alvar area. Um, we are kind of here, but I can, if, if the cursor is seen, but roughly you can point to any part of the map and say that is where you are. So let us take another jump forward. Um, for some reason, I seem to be freezing here. There we are. Yeah. So Rajasthan has been home to various groups and communities from early times. And very often these names are they being used in common. They go back in time, but we don't think of that when we use them. So as I say, there can be terms like Maru, which, which is the desert or the land of the dead, which is a very dramatic way of putting it. And then there, there are the terms which become part of Marwar, Jangal, which is Bikaner, Val, Matsya, Pragvat, Mirpat. Much later, you have the uh, kingdom of Johan, Prithviraj Johan, and that is Sapadalaksh. Arbuda is Abu. Now, all of these are terms used for di different areas, but sometimes they can be used simultaneously. So as I say, the OLAP is confusing if you look at it without chronology or context, but the average person doesn't really care about the chronology. They'll just say we are, for example, we are Porvals, we belong to this area. We are Oswals, we belong to, now they belong to where the city of Osiya was, which has also changed names. So humans, live that's the way that they have got it from you know what they've heard in families or from other people and when we look at something with the historian's eye we also look at uh, traditional um, uh, texts and what the treks tell us so these there have been presence of many political units many of them have not kept their in their existence or their entity across the centuries many did why am I going on about it? Because very often you have large empires like the Mauryan Empire, like the Gupta Empire, like the Mughal Empire, and they take in the smaller states and then they come apart and then you know they disintegrate and the smaller units reappear and leave us very often with questions that get asked on WhatsApp, you know, like, did you know this happened and why does nobody talk about it? Nobody talks about a lot of this because there's a limit of what can actually stay in here. You know, that's why we write down things and that's why they would write down or they would memorize in certain ways. They could be traditions. I am going to come to some of the art traditions in a minute, but they would be traditions which would tell those stories, the Purans, the Khyats, the ways of having a traveling coward, taking the information. So just to stay on Right. Well, we, we are coming to some of the early historic excavated sites, Rangmahal, Berat, Sambhar, Red, Nagar, and Nagri. But 
This makes it kind of more interesting to look at. This is at Bairat or Viratnagar, capital of Matsya. And Ashokan um, um, epigraphs have been found here, including something very famous known as the Babru Perat uh, Rock Edict, which is with the Asiatic Society in Calcutta now. What you're looking at is the remains of the stupa that they had here. Ashoka visited himself, it seems, in the 13th year of his reign. So this was an important place. It's not so important now. But to give you another image, these are some of the monasteries. And the uh, rocks have that shape. That is the rock on which the epigraph was informed. It was known for a long time. This place was known for a long time as Bijak Ki Pahari. Bijak locally becomes a map, but more a treasure map. And why is it a treasure map? Nobody could read the script. So, you know, whoever wrote it, they thought the local villagers would have said, Bahat Purana hai, and it is uh, local history. And uh, only the real you know, hero can decipher it and find the buried treasure. In this case, this history of ours is our buried treasure. So we have this here. We found lots of other evidence of the past here. Takes us back at least to the period of Ashok. And what you have, the Grish Patinard coins are the punched mark coins of this period. So I'm now looking at material which came from those few excavated sites, which are roughly post Buddha and Mahavir's uh, lifetime, the sixth century. We are moving closer to Ashokan period. The, what you have here is a Yakshi, but please look at her headdress. This is a turban because that was fashionable at that point. And she is the size of an average coffee mug. Uh, I mean, the remains that we have. Now, what I have here, because I'm compressing time, are gold coins. Actually, I wish I had them here. I don't. They, they are images from a museum. And uh, one of them belongs to Samudragupta of the Gupta, the emperor. The other one belongs to his son, Chandragupta Vikramaditya often confused with a mythical Vikramaditya who was, you know, it was a golden age period, it was all good. Now at this point, please don't ask a question saying which is which, because one of the viewers would probably be better fitted to answer that question. I've been told, but I forget. It's interesting symbols on it, because you will find, um, if, if I can get my cursor. All right, now look at this. Sometimes at the, in the Harappan seals, there is some sort of a stick with a, with an incense burner on it and then some emblem. Totems have been used through time. The fluidity of this fits in with the later art traditions. But I'm going to again leave this here as ways of telling in a very brief way that Rajasthan had sites which have yielded punch marked coins, which have yielded evidence like the Yakshi here, which have yielded these um, coins. And again, this is, uh, I don't have time to play my usual game with you. So look down here, where you will see what looks like a lion face. This is the goddess, you've just seen the headdress. So this is a goddess with the headdress, at least we think she is, we have no means of knowing, we are playing the game of trying to identify. Uh, beneath her seems to be an animal. And I have no means of proving to you that this is an early form of Mahisha Sur Mardini, the goddess slaying the demon Mahisha, though that is how she is identified uh, in, in um, archaeological and hist hist um, art and history books. But I will show you another image a little further on. So this might be one of the earliest images that Rajasthan has of the great goddess slaying the demon uh, this is a period where the goddess worship is quite prominent. Uh, something else that is there. So this is around Chittor. This is the site of Nagri, Madhyamika Nagri. Apparently there was a bustling city here. We find evidence of that city. We find coins which are known locally as Damri, which is from a much later word, um, taking its origin from the Greek word drachma, which means a coin. But just to give you a size, um, people call it Akbar ka Hatibara. You know, Akbar kept his elephants here when he was attacking Chittor. 
you just have to take my word or the word of historians who've written on it and the epigraphs that this predates Akbar by at least, well, let's see, uh, almost 2000 years. And look at the school uh, building at the back there, gives you an idea of the size. Look at the size of each block of stone. So this is the Nagri uh, royal enclosure, not royal, a forest kind of religious enclosure with no temple to it. Now, staying still with early history, you have the Mauryan Empire, but along with the fall of the Mauryan Empire, you have some very uh, early Shak, Kushan and Gupta period evidence. Because we don't have that actual physical evidence in our hand, what we have are some of these items which end up in museums. So this is one uh, display at the Bikaner Museum. And it says in both Hindi and English, it is Aj Ek Pad, one foot, one leg, not foot so much, one leg, which is like an elephant's foot. Aj is the head of a goat. And this is, uh, um, he holds something indeterminate, probably a beach pura, in the uh, left hand, the broken right hand. Now, though this might look very much like a Harry Potter uh, creation, this predates Harry Potter. And there is reference in the Rig Veda to an Ajayk path, but no image of it. So possibly there were more such uh, uh, images across uh, India at a time we were not working in stone. Stone sculpture comes in around the time of uh, Kanishk, the Kushan emperor and the Gupta emperors. Before that, we are using more of terracotta. But I have another image here, and that is, again, from the sites around Bikaner. Now, look at the drapery. There are some kind of Greek influence on the drapery. But if you're still not convinced, here is Mahadev and Parvati. And while Shiva is sitting cross-legged, look at the pose of in which the goddess is sitting. You know, you don't normally have legs dangling in this very much Grecian way. I, again, want to leave it there and I want to leave it there for you to kind of explore and ask what is happening. But roughly this is northern Rajasthan around Bikaner, around Ganganagar. Um, and roughly this is the area where much earlier to this period where these terracotta plaques come from, the Harappan sites were. So this is not Jaipur or anywhere near Udaipur. It's a different part. Meanwhile, another point I want to make is that resources aid the growth of states. So this uh, salt from Sambar, which is still being consumed and to an extent is still being extracted in the way that this, so they've now got different ways of drawing water and killing off the salt itself. This is what led to the growth of something like the Chauhan Kingdom. Salt was traded across. We have uh, the temples around it, like Seekers Harshad Mata Temple, has an epigraph, has an inscription of how much was being brought in by the people who were trading. And as a thank you, they would give offerings to the temples because they had made a profit in the trade of salt. Spare a moment for salt here something I never thought about even when we read about Gandhiji and the salt march in Dandi. Salt is required by everyone. Even goats in villages need to have their little amount of salt. During fast, fasts, people will have the Sendha Namak, the Sondha Namak, however you want to call it. It used to be natural salt originally coming from Sindh, hence that name. But we also have a preference for rock salt, which came again from the northwestern areas of uh, the Indian subcontinent. So people have a preference for which salt they want to use. Your money comes in. With this, I have another image. This is in the Zawar area. It's a hut built on top of old kothalis or crucibles and pipes and uh, uh, the remains of how they were extracting metal and making zinc locally. Now, how far back? This is all slag from the leftover material. Sometimes it's lead slag when they had taken out silver much earlier on, 6th century AD 
or sixth century common era a term i heard hate but i'm not going into why i hate here uh, this is i put two images together this is debris this is the stuff that they need to throw away it's so high or it was so high that's mr paliwal who was working for the hindustan zinc at that, that point so this is how much debris there is left of zinc at the point uh, that the uh, mewar kingdom is in its very young age say before the 6th century they are making they are taking out local silver they are taking out a little bit of lead they are using it then it kind of dies out in that area but the the mines are there much later in about the 8th 10th and 14th century they start using those mines somewhere along that time extraction or distillation of zinc which is a huge process in itself is discovered it adds to the local economy it has again been forgotten so each time you have a special resource you have a stronger kingdom you build on it when that resource either dies out you lose out uh, there are also more romantic tales than just these images so maharana pratap hid in one of these and i don't think it was like physically high i think he used it as a base camp because it still was capable of giving silver there are forts here of that period so temporarily the the treasury of maharana pratap would have moved here but one of the mines is known as maharana pratap kan kan um, urdu mein ya farsi mein kan hota tha shabd ab nahi hai ab khan hi bolte hain now uh with the decline of the gupta empire many smaller groups tried to get their own mastery in northern india and out of them some of these warriors take on the term of rajputra or rajput which is the descendant or the son of a king and out of these during this period of say about 700 to 1200 some of the main names that we talk about are the pratihars of maru and gurjar desh gohils of mewar mauryas of chittor and kota and the chauhans but there are many others the mathura area still has the sursens and over time that group becomes known as the yadus yadavs jadons jadus uh, yadava they will say hum yadu vanshi hai to differentiate from many others and the kachwahas and then earlier groups that we read about in the past or whose names come to us or whose images come to us for example the nags now uh, the tirthankar parshwanath swami is associated with snakes he's got a nag in his thing so the nags are a very important uh, community at one point but they then eventually they lose out and they come back down to us in iconography merely as snakes somewhere they seem to have been a real tribe the gupta empire talks about defeating a lot of uh, rulers with the name nag in their names the mauryas bhadanaks badgujars a whole lot of them become less dominant now about the political history i want to come back to some of the more visually pleasing things this is one of our early stone built temples is in mewar it's immediately post gupta 6th century it's a temple at jagat which has archaeological survey of india protection this image down here they're all images of the they're all pictures of the same temple and with the people there you can see the size so a small shikhar mandap ardh mandap and here you have a view from the outer gate to the image of to the inner part it is uh, one of the few remaining temples of that era mainly because we also it's not just destruction all the time very often we pull down older structures and rebuild them and that has also happened through time so just to show you the scale of work that has gone on uh toda rising has this huge elephant and if you look at the hut behind that gives you a sense of the size if you look at the pallu saraswati one image is in the bikaner museum the other image is in the this one is from the from the bikaner museum 
but the other one is in the national museum in delhi so when it, whichever you are near please go and have a look and she is saraswati but she is the saraswati of the jain tradition these three massive creatures are the buffaloes there is a story attached they are from mount abu and you can just about see a hole here the story is that every night the water of a tank would be emptied and one night the king's brother hit praladan he found there were these three demons who turned into buffaloes so with one arrow he shot them uh, this was built in his honor and there's a statue of him shooting an arrow also but think of the artist who is making these and putting them up this image is actually the one of the mahishasur mardani from abaneri and you will see i can't because of the way my screen sharing is showing but somewhere down here near her foot you will see this funny little um, cat or lion face peeping out and that is her vahan that is her lion you have her trident the saspahu temples again this is the period where the zavar zinc uh, not zinc zavar silver and other metals might have been helping mewar and its economy grow but we know too little about this one time capital at nagda this image also is very old it's now been kind of paved over and reclaimed by the authorities to look appealing but i think we've covered over a lot of old history so just to give you an idea the 10th century temple at jhalara patan so this is one of the traditions of architecture that gets developed and continued you have a shikhar you have a space in front the mandap you have a space separate and then how our own 10th 12th century chhajjas start uh, then um, start adding to it i think i'm running in different directions so this is jhalra patan where the story goes that there were so many bells that you would hear the jhalars late at night that again is a legend while i have this other image um, osia abaneri down here uh, bhand devda here i want to bring one more point very often people will say why did xy state not combine against a more powerful ruler so i want to go back to even the pre islamic times very often that question comes in the context of the rajput kingdoms and akbar you know why did they not stand up together one they are states who view themselves as states but even in the period where the gujar pratihars ruled over most of northern india a place near jaipur now called chaksu it was then called chatsu with a t sound to it and a local ruler a gohil ruler 8th century uh, there is a uh, there is a epigraph uh, so you have more information in my book on this but what we find about shankargan is that on behalf of his overlord his param bhattarak his chief king he marched with his troops with his small little lashkar troops that lashkar word is not there he marched with his troops and washed his blood ridden blood stained sword at the confluence of the river ganga with the ocean uh, because he had fought on behalf of his lord that is the gurjar pratihar ruler of kannauj against the ruler of gaur so from rajasthan somebody goes and dies far away from home why because their overlord demands that or you know does not demand your death necessarily but you you are sworn to help your overlord so you know we need to think of this in a slightly different way to why does rima speak from this room to why do people do such a thing in a broader more generalized manner now by the 7th and 8th century this uh, rajput warrior code and the culture becomes a feature of parts of northern india especially when we talk of rajasthan so to an extent the footsteps of the earlier uh, the, you know the prints of the earlier kingdoms can be seen in the newer kingdoms that are set up very often not by the same dynasty but the same capitals sometimes become the new capitals the same little site you'll have a story of a ruler is uh, you know some young 
uh, adventurer warrior is somewhere has a dream digs up finds a temple finds a palace makes it the new home you know we we choose the same kind of places to live on you need water you need a good place to stay you need protection that's how a lot of them come now having set themselves up whether they are insiders or outsiders and i say that because the rathore st uh, uh, story in itself talks about coming into this part of rajasthan in the 12th century with an earlier um a ruler rao siha from whom they take their descent and he is linked to the gaharwal kingdom back in kanjoj so they then expand and regardless of the nature of the terrain they expand to set up their own large or small territories keep that in mind i have realized by this point that uh, i knew i would going to talk more than i need to so i will not be able to focus on issues of gender i would not be able to focus on the kinds of foods eaten very briefly i do want to talk on camels because i would have thought camels were always in rajasthan apparently not and apparently they are com they come into rajasthan uh, people doing research on this think they come in by about the 8th century it didn't make sense to me as a child but then you look at stories like the pabuji story in which uh, the utani comes from lanka now lanka doesn't have to be sri lanka modern day ceylon but there is a lanka and so it's a it's a story of a she camel being brought in we did have horses but then they also talk about the horses of the desert and they say ki they would fly over they would fly through the seas of sand so they are a hardier breed and today when we talk of marwadi horses they are probably those ones again i'm going to carry on with the pictures so think of trade trade was always here for centuries but a place like pali which now someone might say is not central in uh, in the history of in, in the story of it is central to the history but it's not central in the history uh, of modern day people's minds it was a very important trade site from the 8th to the 14th century you know they talk about velvet from china chin coming in they were talked about uh, sandalwood red sandalwood from the south coming through pali so keep in mind that the past has had many uh, faces to it and the rise and fall of different places has happened okay staying with architecture just for a bit Uh, or rather coming back to architecture so this is near chandravati in the abu area so look at the pillars here fairly standard building of that period perhaps look at and i go back uh, ahar and the tank at the cenotaphs and the, again the single columns and this is much later so this is 10th century 8 to 10th this is 15th century 16th century the jagat shiromani temple made by the queen of raja man singh of amer when her eldest son died so this is the raja man singh who was commander in chief of the mughal armies again using some of these column elements but then developing beyond it so i want to show you how those same columns those single columns become one two three columns being used here uh the architecture is there i am kind of glossing over the long term history to bring you now to ajmer which was an important capital for prithviraj chauhan and you can see part of the uh, fortifications of ajmer in the background and because it is important once the capital has fallen both delhi and ajmer fall to mohammad of ghor's forces uh a place of religious worship needs to be made and they use local materials but more to the point they use local builders so one of the other trends that you will find in the buildings of rajasthan is that by the time the true arch comes in they are so used to making the corbelled arch that it's the local artisans doing it and uh, this tradition carries on for a very long time simultaneously uh we have a lot of elaborate temples and shrines coming up with a lot of carving in marble or other forms of stone delwada near mount abu the two uh, jain ministers 
had this built. Uh, as a thumb rule, very early sculpture, as you saw with that little head from uh, the woman with the turban and the Mahishasur Mardani, are relatively plain. Uh, more complex by, say, the 12th to 14th century, even the 18th century, and then slightly plainer when you come to the 20th century art. But that's a generalization because if somebody is building a temple, then they will definitely say, please copy this uh, elaborate toran for me. Please make this ceiling for me. So it's partly a question of what is possible using old materials, partly a question of the what appeals to us aesthetically, what we think is nice, then we replicate that design. Again, what have I done? I've taken a jump in time to a period where different religious shrines are being built, different kingdoms are in existence, they are trading, and around them, uh, they, they have relations with each other's uh, kingdoms, and they have relations or they have bad relations with each other's kingdoms and good and bad relations with each other's neighbors, like with the sultans of Delhi or Gujarat or Malwa. Uh, Chittor was a uh, thriving city, fort city within the fort. So again, we have two victory towers there or two towers there. This is the Tower of Fame, Kirti, next to a temple to Adinaji, the Rikhab Devji's temple and this uh, Kirti Stam. And this also there are epigraphs which say that in the 12th century, it was a thriving city for trade. Fortifications come in because of partly because of necessity, partly uh, it's a way of protecting the capital city or the capitals. But a lot of people do not live in the forts all the year round. The villagers are outside at times of defeat or sorry, at times of invasion, they come into the city, into the forts. And one of the reasons that Rajasthan has had a lot more forts built by about the 12th century and then in the 16th century is that with the fall of uh, some of the earlier older kingdoms and the replacement of those earlier older kingdoms in the Punjab and Northwest frontier area, uh, the Rajput rulers found themselves kind of in a standalone situation. And basically they stand alone even when they are being uh, attacked by another neighbor. So it's not just a Mughal uh, or pre-Mughal Sultanate uh, Sultan's army attacking one fort. Very often the Hindus were also attacking each other's forts. Not that many examples, but definitely the fort of Tannot, which no longer exists. But the older uh, in, uh, attack on Tannot was by the Bhuttos, Bhatis, and Varaha Muslim, uh, Rajputs uh, uh, against the Bhatis. Here we have images of uh, the fort of Bhatner, now Hanumangar, right on top. Here we have the, uh, you can't see the water here, but you will in a minute of Gagron. This is Taragad at Ajmer, above Ajmer. And this is a from Jalor of the plains below because water is important. So this particular one is of that. So the ruler's citadel would be inside the fort, but the ruler was not always inside the fort. Ruler and the families would be outside with the people at, uh, in times of peace. Uh, sometimes fighting in other wars. Just to give you an idea, uh, Sivana, Mirta, Mirta, Maldives fought at Mirta, Chittor, Rana Kumbha's, allegedly Rana Kumbha's palace, uh, 19th century uh, reconstruction done. Uh, my, my colleague, Dr. Giles Tillotson, has got a plate in an older. Uh, uh, Todd version, which talks of the, um, sorry, I, I'm not sure if I've lost all of you or I've lost the screen, but I'll get back to you in a second, uh, says that this is built in the 19th century. And one of the early Todd volumes has the original building as it was very definitely not Padmini's period, but it's there nonetheless. Um, Jamal Patta's palace, you can name anything. Chittor's Victory Tower, made by Rana Kumbha using his architects. Uh, interestingly, Kumbha's period saw the construction of 32 out of the 82 forts known to Mewar. Uh, 
you can look at it whichever way you want one that he likes to build so he's building but then also he's building to fortify the kingdom he's building because it's a period of prosperity he's rebuilding to protect the the kingdom so all of this is happening at the same time and uh, the the star of uh, victory by jeta and kumpa the architects uh, also it has all, almost all the deities you can think of including the inscription in arabic of uh, allah inside it so that brings us to re re returning us to the importance of ajmer as a site the darga here the this uh, dome the darga building was was akbar's uh, contribution because he was coming here often enough but i want to also draw your attention to this building on the side which to ajmer people it was known as the tehsil building earlier or the magazine as the british called it and i don't mean a journal or a magazine that you read this was where the asla or the arsenal was but again think of this uh, try in your mind to recall the lal qila at uh, at um, um, agra try in your mind to read the lal qila at delhi and pictures that you can easily google of the lal qila at lahore if you haven't already seen them this is the dolat khana that was built there was a fortification wall around this which kept uh, this part um, in kind of relative safety but they didn't need more safety there was a outer wall this is where the emperor came this is where the emperor stayed uh, just to again drive home the the human angle part so dara shikho the man who could have been emperor but wasn't dara shikho was born in ajmer this part, this fort dara shikho Uh, grew up and they all moved away from here but darashiko's final defeat at the battle of uh, dorai was uh, not far from ajmer and so he you know he would have gone past this area in his defeated state and was imprisoned for a while near the alwar area before he was put to death so this is also where jahangir uh, emperor jahangir gave audience to thomas ro on behalf and who had come on behalf of the east india british east india company and uh, you might imagine to yourself whether you know it was one of these windows that he met no of course actually thomas row went inside and it was not just one meeting where this very dramatic yes you know you can have this trade these were diplomatic negotiations which took place over a lot of time but that makes the story slower and less interesting so let's take another jump staying with the theme of buildings there we are this is between this is at berat but not where you saw the um, the the buddhist monastery this is nearer the delhi jaipur road and this is a gateway that was built and it's it's in the book i had somewhere on my table earlier by dr chandramani on protected monuments of uh, rajasthan built for jahangir to come through salim to come through called of course the mogal gateway on one of these walls is a flat uh, basque image of akbar and inside uh, there are images of uh, uh, ras leela in one but mostly mostly the images are i'm going in the wrong direction so that's a preview for you are of geometrical patterns and here again you see the remains of water flowing out to be a charbagh uh the the rest of this is now part of another shrine um and so we don't really know where the the there was a full charbagh there's every possibility it was so what is happening with uh, the mogal empire there is a period of overall prosperity across parts of india there is also a period of uh, fighting like you have with say pratap and his son amar singh against the mughal emperor but it also means that there is again once again like in the gupta period like at the mauryan period there is a pan form of art so across rajasthan and into the delhi gujarat area there is a commonality even though there is a regional difference in their art forms similarly food habits and others there is a commonality and yet a distinction so this is around that period where we do a sort of a A, a jump 
in, in historical terms, and I kind of go over the whole area in three seconds and jump more and bring you to the frescoes within Udaipur city palace. So 17th, 18th, 19th century being covered. This is in the government museum, not in the city palace museum. This is the part of the city palace that was given to the government when old Mewar state merged. So you will see scenes of uh, the elephant fight, of the horse, of the warfare, um, of the ruler with the nimbus around his head. And more scenes, uh, the famous Shish Mahal of Amir, the Raja Karan Singh's uh, room at uh, Bikaner, uh, room at uh, Mehran Gar scribed to Takat Singh Ji, um, 1987, down here, village hut in Jaisalmer, where she used cow dung and lime and uh, clay, what little clay she could get, to decorate her one-room place with her kitchen area in this fancy way. So now as I bring in my little sobering thought that next time you go into any of these old palaces and you look around and you say, wow, please say the wow. But then don't say, I wish I was that ruler, because you never know that ruler could have ordered something. You know, I've seen this in, I don't know, Burhanpur. Make me a similar thing. And by the time that similar thing is reproduced in that little big or little palace, that ruler could have gone on and died in battle somewhere else. That was a reality of life. You didn't always enjoy the splendor that you put in. You didn't always get to read the books that your court patronized the poet or the writer to write. You may not have always seen the paintings that were um, uh, you know, commissioned for you. Okay, now I've taken a lot of your time, so let's move closer to the 19th, 20th century. With the British uh, East India Company and with treaties with the Indian states, most of the uh, kingdoms of Rajasthan signed treaties with the East India Company between 1803 and 1823. So there's this kind of 20 year period in which they signed and they re-signed. So the new state of Bharatpur, which is set up, set up from scratch, um, has its first treaty in 03 and then it treaty gets revised. Tonk is an absolutely new state which is set up to get the Pindari problem resolved. So Amir Khan and the Pindaris are attacking large parts of Northern India. And then there is a, uh, an agreement and Tonk as a new state is carved out and their weapons are taken, You know, some of their big cannons are taken away. But the deal is you stay put, you stop robbing other places and you settle down and provide good governance. Uh, as it happens, uh, again, I refer to my own book, but there is a lot on talk and they did have good governance at one point and in 1890 something or eight, yes, uh, two women, two Muslim women went from talk state to Agra to study medicine. They did not have MBBS in the country at that time. I think they had, did not have a master in, in or a, a bachelor's in any of the, the medical sciences back then but they were given these licentiates. So that is what these two young ladies went and studied. And the Sunehri Kothi and the Tehsil building at Tonk. And winding up, I want to come again, stay with the 19th and 20th century. So during the, this period, most of the rulers have been on their thrones for a long time. So again, let's give a general thing, the Mewar dynasty, uh, has off and on, you know, the collateral or the, uh, the immediate family, but they have been in the same area, whether it is from a capital like Nagda or a capital like Chittor or a capital like Udaipur or Gogunda, but they have been there from the seventh century. And very often, if it's not direct descent, don't, and keep in mind this, that as long as you have a common ancestor, that is how the people perceived it to be the same dynasty. So in that process, by the time they have their treaties with the British 
and then you have 1857 and in 1858 uh, queen victoria becomes empress of india malkai hind so with the coming in of the malkai hind there are representatives at the uh, courts wherever they've been these treaties by this time the uh, treaties with the british east india company now become they get transferred to the crown it why am i stuck on this image and that is that you have several types of stories of this period you have your uh, very good ruler of whom there are very few and then you have your not so caring ruler who basically finds it interesting to just while away time with uh, learning you know they always had shikar they always had drink but you might give up more and more of your administration to uh, your your counselors to the regents sometimes they young children who become the ruler so the the Ma raj mata maji sahiba are the part of the regency council the british set up the british agents are always very keen to have governance but they like to make sure it is kept in their own hands and uh, uh, my example of the good governance sorry i was getting a little distracted there were phones coming at the same time ganga singh is a young boy when he gets adopted by his older brother who has no son older brother dies he's seven years old he's then Whereas traditionally a ruler, like say Savai Jai Singh, the second of Jaipur, was 10 when he becomes Maharaja and he's expected to start ruling to the best of his ability with his advisors immediately. Once the East India Company and then after that the British uh, crown is there, they follow the thing of you need to be 18 to be a major to rule. Therefore, more of the Regency Councils, more of the rules with, uh, with other uh, committees. So Ganga Singh is then not given his full ruling rights, sent away to boarding school, becomes a major, becomes 18 year old in the year when the famine of 1898-99 is happening. This is the great famine, the Chapana Akal. It's Chapan in the Sambat calendar, 1956 Sambat, that is the period. And when he does, I'll stay with that for a minute, like several others, Jodhpur has the same thing. They put their energies towards famine relief. But one of the thoughts that comes to this young boy's mind is that if there was water, you know, that's why I started with water in the early thing. So many people would not have died of thirst. If you had water, you could grow more food. If you had water, you could do a lot more things. So water becomes something central to what he wants to do. In later years, he works on it. As an 18 year old, they won't listen to him. So he then goes, uh, he, his forces go to China on the Boxer, uh, to put down the Boxer Rebellion, so-called rebellion. His forces go on the second, in the first world war, his forces are uh, present in Egypt, in France. He himself takes part, he's a signatory to the Treaty of Versailles, which ends the, uh, which, which has peace after the first world war. He's a representative at the, round table conferences. So water is something he works for and he brings in the Gang Canal in 1927 in a state that has no river. He basically talks his way into getting the water. So the water from the Satluj comes in. The second thing that he finds at the same period is that if there was a, a railway, which Bikaner did not have, then food and fodder could have gone to the furthest parts of the kingdom, Bikaner kingdom and people again would not have died. So he works on getting a railroad, railway, which, which has to be joined up to the Marwar Railway. And when uh, finally, when Bikaner joins New Rajasthan in 49, I think a thousand kilometer mile, mile, they were still in miles, track of railway comes into Rajasthan with the merger of Bikaner. So India then is one new India, the rulers sign their treaties. Most of them sign before 15th August 1947. Bikaner is one of the ones that does sign. And this is the bit that you might find, you know, why I put this in, how boring. But I want you to think about it before we finally say goodbye. 
we have these 19 states all of whom have their own maharajas all of whom by this point have prime ministers all of most of them have judges courts hospitals some of them even have a high court or a chief court now suddenly they all fit into this new rajasthan so at the one hand you know if if you have been prime minister of uh, sirohi you are a nobody because there's going to be a chief minister of rajasthan so that's okay that's the administration but the process is not easy so administration judiciary finances state forces and the irony i want to stress on the state forces irony is that somebody might have gone and fought in the second world war which most of the princely states sent out their troops and uh, they could have been from the desert area marwar bikaner jaisalmer barmer was not a separate kingdom at that point it's a district uh, but when you come back and say i want to join the new indian indian army they would they would say yes but you know you have trachoma in your eyes it, which is caused by the desert you are unfit to join so they were fit enough to fight in the war but not fit enough so then how do they their cases get argued how do some of them rise to high positions in the indian army and go on to you know protect india in the uh, against china and protect places like nathula and other peaks along with it we have land reforms because now we are a democratic country and therefore you don't have your rulers so what happens with the jagirs and abolition of jagirdari system is one of the things that happens at the rajasthan new legislative assembly level very early on 52 reforms come in the uh, vinoba bhave comes in and people give their land bhudan they have records of the rich and the elite giving away their land panchayati raj comes in i have a spelling mistake i notice on inauguration uh the in october 1959 panchayati raj is introduced at nagor in rajasthan and lots of other states uh, schemes come in uh, this is a uh, very i'm going to just read out some of this don't bother if you are not a rapid reader but basically this is a complex process of uh, political and administrative integration because most of these kingdoms had existed for several centuries and they had their own systems of you know biga even how much is your kachcha biga how much is your pakka biga what is your coinage they had their administration coins judiciary police even their weights and measures dialects customs you might think it doesn't really matter maybe it doesn't but just again a small example so the festival of tej is celebrated in many parts of india but particularly in rajasthan and usually if you, unless you know you might think that the only tej is the savan tej which falls on the third day the month of savan but in parts of rajasthan they also have the kajri or the saturi or the the tej which falls in the dark half of bhado uh, it you know you can say all of this doesn't matter but when you are actually going through the change it's a little difficult to do it but they did it the second paragraph talks about the financial year so udaipur bharatpur bikaner kishangarh shapura and jaisalmer used to begin on the 1st of july the financial year end on the 30th of june jodhpur kota bundi jhalawar pratapgarh pratapgarh devgarh that is dungarpur baswara dholpur used to start on the 1st of october end in september uh, sirohi and tonk was 1st of november ended on 31st so then new india of course has 1st april to 31st march which nobody has so they have to get used to you know finishing their uh, accounting accordingly now in many states in most almost all the states british indian currency but in some states local states were also allowed to have their own coins so in jaipur state there were receipts that were kept one column had the kaldar that is the british coins then there were the jhar shahi coins of jaipur state so the one column had that and then they would be converting these so you had them jhar shahi converted to kaldar kaldar converted to jhar shahi the total amount in jhar shahi and as rani lakshmi kumari late rani lakshmi kumari ji chundavat who was a mla and a very time mla and a writer uh, she said that in her childhood 
it would be a problem if they were traveling because Udaipur state at that point had three types of rupees. Sarup Shahi, which had 17 annas, Chittori, which had 16, and Chandori, which had nine or 10. And you had to you know, decide how you were calculating. But the minute she left Mewar, and they were coming to Ajmer, as you see, they had to be exchanged and the rates varied. And they had to buy the British Indian currency. So all of this, which seems, uh, you know, like Kyawa, it's only a question of merger. We are all doing this. They all did it, but it could not happen overnight. And it was not so easy to, to happen and uh, was something that they needed to think about. And now I'm going to just end with the fact that once New India comes in, they, the temples of New India are also being built. So in the case of the Thar Desert, something that Ganga Singh Ji puts in, Ganga Singh Ji of Bikaner puts in, which is the initial part of the Gang Canal, then starts being made into the Rajasthan Canal. It's now the IGNP. Uh, a film called Dobun Pani done by K. Abbas talks about the changes that happen. But this is actually this, the circumstance in which the sand would actually come down into the place each time you're working. The other is, and I think this is my final image, is when the big dams were coming up on the river because we needed hydroelectricity. I mean, in retrospect, things do change and can be questioned. But the intention there was power, water, more food. So in a nutshell, Rajasthan uh, past and future is closely linked with water, which I brought in. It is linked with large spaces. It is linked with changes over time between who is the political master, but it is linked with something that for people is kind of everlasting, that is their lifestyle, their way, and the long heritage we have of the past, of all the, what we remember, which is under the ground and lost to us, what we remember that is above the ground in museums, uh, things that we might be consciously destroying, but whatever we are with, so thank you again for giving me this opportunity to uh, talk to all of you. And I think I've gone on and on forever, but I hope um, it has been a, overall an overview. So over to you now, Ishan. Thank you so much, Dr. Huja, for this beautiful lecture, because uh, you know, uh, what we can say is Rajasthan had a very long history. So uh, doing it in one hour is a very tedious task, but you weaved it very beautifully and very eloquently. And I think we all enjoyed what you showed us and what you talked about. And from, from the earliest of times to the present day Rajasthan as we know it. So thank you so much for doing this lecture and for giving us your time, especially on a work day like today. So there are some, some questions. And before that, I would also like to ask you a question. And that is not related to what you spoke today. It is not related to the architecture, but the socio-political scenario of Rajasthan in the 18th century. So when we say that in, in the 18th century Marwar, do we see untouchability and the, uh, the, the, pure, the, the notion of purity of lineages? And okay. what do you, how do you understand that? Okay, so uh, two things. One is untouchability. Yes, there is untouchability, as in, in their minds of the people of the 18th century, whether it is Marwar or anywhere else, have a notion of uh, uh, different castes, of castes that are not allowed to do certain things or that are practicing certain uh, uh, crafts or trades that are viewed as being unclean. That is one. Purity of races is another point. I don't, with no literature is really talking about a purity of a race in that sense. They might talk of a lineage that has, you know, that they, are, they might be the part of the top three castes. They might say that they are descended from a Brahman or from a warrior or from a mixed thing, but they will not necessarily link it with race, right? They might also, I mean, this whole thing of why do we have 
uh, the the issue of fire origin and does that mean that some of the rajputs have been purified by fire they don't act when you talk to them and ask for their uh, their meaning groups that come out of the fire or groups that don't come out of the fire and ask for their own history say you know like historical uh, literature uh, references talk about x group being outside to india like you know you are descended from scythians that are the shaks and they say really you know like our history goes back to our own personal family history tells us we are from the moon or the sun and so they don't consciously make that distinction i don't know if that really answered your question but that uh, untouchability part has carried on into into post uh, into modern day india modern day rajasthan also and they've had to work the same way as for the rest of india against it so uh, in rajasthan there is also this uh, criminal tribe as they know it the bawaria tribe so can you can you tell us about that okay so again i don't know how much uh, you all of you know about the scheduled caste and the scheduled tribe groups coming from a list that was drawn up suchi banai gayi in 1916 there was a listing of backward groups as see what happens when you try to make sense of something whether it is as a student whether it is as somebody in a new space whether it is as part of the british administration trying to understand an area so they draw up a list and in that process groups that they find are indulging in activities which are anti social so it's not just the babariyas it's the sansis also they get listed as criminalized or criminal tribes others get listed as uh, wait they can be criminal groups also some get listed as castes so they are, come on this schedule which is revised and then becomes part of the scheduled list which has got castes in the one hand and which has got tribes in the other so the word sc st has its roots going back to the 1916 listing which then gets revised and so they are one of the groups that for whatever reason sometimes they were performing tribes so the nuts and sasis were actually performers but once those courts go once the patronage goes they do not have access to a livelihood and some of them turn to anti social activities but that that uh, that label that tabka that sto stays and becomes a way of defining them well into our times which is like a shame that we have to keep using labels so yeah so this question is from alkesh and his question is can you please throw some light on the amjhara especially the images of gaj lakshmi found at dhod and amjhara okay so again i am going to now refer you to if if you can actually send the email refer you to the fact book or to the concise history which is just a little bit less fact but amjhara images are one of our hordes using the local stone this is the dungarpur that area uh, i am not a specialist in the art history but it does intrigue me when you find in a one large area either metal images coming up in large numbers or stone images coming up in large numbers and is one is that they are being created so that whole amjhara area they are making temples they are making these images where are they going if they are all for local consumption that again you know then what do we know of the state at that time is it just random temples is there somebody uh, a ruler a chief someone who is kind of wanting it made and why in that area dhod again is an important uh, so the 10th century again i'm going to refer you to the book because otherwise it's going to be and, and dhod is a very important mini state which again gets subsumed in uh, in the the whole uh, i'm going to just try and actually give you the reference if i can find it now even as i'm talking uh perhaps not but but it is in my earlier segments so okay gohels of chatsu mewad and dhod 232 but then i think dhod continues to be in existence for much longer 
So what have I said to myself or to you? Um, here we go. Okay, we don't want a lot. We are talking of lots of coins. I have a lot. You don't really want all of this. One branch of the Gohels ruled from uh, Dhavagat, later Dhod. Not much is known about them, but the Dhod inscription of the 7th uh, century refers to the Gohel chief Dhanik of uh, Dhavagat as a feudatory of Param Bhattarak Maharaja Tirad Parmeshwar Dhavalapadev as suggested this king is identical to King Dhaval of the Maurya lineage in an inscription from Kansua in 732. Later, Thod seems to have passed into the possession of the Chauhans, for we learn that in 1168, Kumarpal, son of Thakur Mangalraj, now this is one of the early references to the term Thakur, governed Dhod as a feudatory of Prithviraj II at Chakambari. Now this becomes a religious center of renown, and over the centuries, notable temples, including that of Nitya Pramod Dev, was built in 1163 by feudatory Kumarpal, uh, Queen Sohara Devi, wife of the Chauhan king, granted land to this temple and in AD 1172, one Bhattar Prabhsarsi had a monastery built here for housing Kapil ascetics from foreign lands. Uh, I'm not going to do this to you. What was the name of the person asking the question? Uh, what was his name again? Okay, Alkesh, Al I'm not doing this again with uh, the Amjara, but it's here and I would be very happy to take out more info and share it with you. So thank you for asking this question. Next question is from Kirtana Votari and his question is, could you please explain the term you mentioned Khan and Khan once? Okay, so like most Indians, what is the word we use for a mine, Khan? In Hindi, and you spoke speak to who remain of a much older generation to me, and uh, if you listen to anything from Iran or Pakistan, they would be using the word Khan, as in Khan here. And some of the early references talk about a Khan, so it seems that certain words are used in common in Farsi and uh, Hindi as it develops. So whichever, wherever the root is coming from, that sound stays, like hapta and sapta. Okay, so I hope that answers your question. Uh, next question is from Ajay Singha, and his question is, in the mid-18th century, what was the region of Jaipur referred to as Dhundar or Ambir? Okay, so basically the kingdom has been Dhundar from the time it was founded. It predates even the Kachwahas becoming the masters, because it, the term comes from, there are several stories about it, but from basically this mound and then the, a demon called Dundi. But Amber becomes one of the capitals. Jaipur becomes another capital. And both times, the Mughal court would use the name of the capital city also when referring to the ruler, the chief. So they would say, Bharmal of Amber, but they mean the kingdom. But why should they talk about a kingdom when they're talking about someone who is part of the empire? So for them, it is simple. And they would say, Amer ke raja nazar pesh kar rahe hai. Ya, you know, wherever it is ke raja. Now, with the British, both terms are there. But what, again, what tends to happen is that the name of the state used interchangeably often is replaced, not just in Jaipur, but with Marwar. So they will say Jodhpur and they mean the state. And uh, so again for uh, Ajay Singha, there is a line in, uh, in most of the Shakespearean things, but in King Lear, I particularly remember having seen this on, on stage where this guy goes down on his knee and he says, Kent, sir. Now, obviously he does not mean the British County of Kent. He was the Duke of Kent in disguise, acknowledging his existence. And he doesn't give his first name or his family name. So this, uh, uh, identification of state and capital and family, ruling family uh, surname with state is kind of blurred lines, 
but the kingdom has always been dhundar and particularly nowadays i kind of underline dhundar because i find that a lot of people in their 20s who come and visit will say oh wow so there is a maharaja of the city of jaipur so there is a maharaja of the city of jodhpur uh, well you know dhundar was beyond the city as i said earlier uh, it was roughly the size of switzerland Uh, so next question is from uh, Soham, and his question is: Is Gurjar Pratihar style of architecture used during early medieval period in Rajasthan? Yes, yes. The so Gurjar Pratihar style is what is used uh, across Rajasthan from basically from the time that style you know starts being uh, used across from. the mandor area through to kannauj and then later on even in the uh, 12th 13th century that remains the basis of it of the gujar pratihar style all along so they even call it the maru pratihar at times so we'll take one last question uh, for the evening and this is from alkesh again and his question is Uh, do you have any information on if there are gaj lakshmis in tonk alwar and Am ambaneri abaneri yes there are gaj lakshmis at abaneri uh, alwar yes tonk i will have to check i haven't yet but uh, certainly if i find more information i'll share it with you ishan so keep the email and or pass it on to me and we we'll, we we'll look at this gaj lakshmi you might also find and uh, in the very early uh, rang mahals uh, terracotta i will check on that also you are on silent i think yeah sorry so thank you so much ma'am for taking out time and for doing this lecture and for this question answer session i hope it, it will help hundreds of students and researchers who are going to research about rajasthan and we hope to have you again real soon for another lecture for another series of lecture because rajasthan history is too vast to uh, you know summarize it in one lecture so thank you so much ma'am and thank you so much everybody who took out time this evening to attend this lecture this lecture will be available on youtube for posterity so if you want to refer to this lecture later you can do that thank you so much and have a great evening thank you thank you once again bye